So to get started this morning, um, we just want to introduce and thank Trailer so much for his time and just being able to come and help us today to share with families the changes that are coming to the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. And as you know, your Sooner Care, uh, Oklahoma is one of the last states to be going to managed care, and it's something that they've been working really hard on. And um, it's something that they were, I mean, they have to do it. It's not something that they necessarily chose to do. So they have, we have a great group of um, staff that's at the Healthcare Authority that really work hard and care about our families across Oklahoma. So we just want to make sure that um, we're able to get this information out to you guys. One of the things that I did want to share is that um, this information is all about families that are already on Sooner Care. So I am going to turn it over to Trailer. But before I do that, I just ask if you have a question, we will answer questions throughout the event and um, throughout the lunch hour. But if you do have a question, please just type it in the chat first so that uh, we can pause um, and we don't interrupt Trailer because we do only have an hour. So I will turn it over to you, Trailer. Thank you so much for being here with us. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first, thank you for having me. I, I love the opportunity to connect and just be able to answer questions uh, and make sure that everyone's kind of uh, singing from the same songbook, if you will, um, from, from our standpoint. I uh, also apologize in advance. I did choose to work from home today because I have the windows open. It's such a beautiful day. I'm loving the crisp air. But um, if the UPS man drives up and my dogs go crazy, I apologize in advance. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to have a conversation about uh, our transition to Sooner Select. And Sooner Select is the brand name that we have chosen to give um, our managed care environment as we go to a new service delivery system. Uh, so as you are probably very well aware now, we are in a fee-for-service model, which essentially is if you um, appear to your, if you go to your physician, the physician's going to submit a claim to the healthcare authority, and we're just going to reimburse that. Um, and we do that directly as the healthcare authority. The new service delivery system is going to involve a third party contractor. In Oklahoma, we're calling those contracted entities rather than a managed care plan. Um, but, and we have chosen three medical uh, companies to provide that service. So it's uh, Edna Better Health of Oklahoma, Humana Healthy Horizons of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma Complete Health. Uh, so they, they will serve uh, and serve as the um, the payer or the insurance company for uh, the, those medical benefits in the Sooner Select program. We also have a separate dental plan uh, that just focuses on dental services. Um, and we have two plans for that. That is DentaQuest and Liberty Dental. Uh, I should also mention that the medical plans that I mentioned a while ago are inclusive of everything not tooth related. So uh, your medical, your mental health, your uh, pharmacy, for example, will all be administered through those uh, those contractors. Um, so I just kind of want to let you know, too, this does not apply to all of the populations uh, that we currently serve. Um, and I just uh, noted a comment on the questions uh, box about uh, specifically seriously emotionally um, disturbed children and maybe our SMI adults. Um, so... Moving over to the new service delivery system will be the majority of our population. So it's going to be your pregnant women, children, um, basically an expansion population, essentially everyone that is not age blind disabled, um, disabled as determined by the Social Security Administration. Uh, also those in long term care, like long term nursing facilities or members served by a waiver like the IDD waiver or the advantage waiver that is administered by the uh, our Department of Human Services. So those members exempted will still be served in the current environment by the health care authority and nothing will change. Um, you will still do your regular renewals, your eligibility updates and all of that good stuff, but you will not transition to sooner select. Um, so just some basics about what is Center Select, kind of why are we doing this? Um, so as, as Terry mentioned, we are in the very small minority of states who still operate a fee-for-service program. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, one of which is uh, cost predictability. So the way that we are going to begin reimbursing for services is that we are going to pay a per member per month cost to each of the managed care plans for each of the members that are enrolled in their certain plan. 
Um, we have worked with consultants and actuaries that have helped create those per member per month payments. And they're based on historical claims data that we know to us with some projected trends moving forward. Um, and so, for example, we know the cost for all of our expansion members, age 19 to 64. Uh, costs may vary depending on age groups or age bands within that. So like over 45 may have a higher cost per member per month, under 45, a little less. And so we're kind of bundling all those costs up into a per member per month. And then we will pay that to those contracted uh, plans um, to reimburse them for the services they are going to reimburse for for the members. All of the services that we currently cover uh, in Sooner Care will still be covered under Sooner Select. Uh, so uh, physician visits, mental health services, pharmacy services, everything we cover the way it's covered now will be covered under Sooner Select. Um, we also uh, have a two-year kind of a, pot, a moratorium on rates. So, uh, which tells the plans they cannot for two years, they have to pay providers in their network at least what the healthcare authority is paying today. Um, we know there's a lot of provider concerns nationally about when you bring managed care in that there's an assumption that the managed care companies are going to immediately increase their profits. And so we have put mechanisms in place to prevent that, one of which is the rate floor. Uh, the next, which is also important to everyone involved is prior authorization criteria. Uh, we don't want to make it more difficult for families and members to access services as we go to Sooner Select. So we have put very specific contract language in our contracts between the healthcare authority and these entities that say you cannot be more restrictive uh, in your prior authorization criteria than the healthcare authority currently is. Um, we also wanted to alleviate the concern of, again, the plans, uh, cutting services, um, making it harder to obtain services or lowering the cost of those services. Uh, so we've kind of stopped all that uh, in, in front of the transition through contracts with those providers. Um, what we uh, expect, though, uh, in addition to the base benefits is, uh, and this is one of the exciting parts about bringing on this new service delivery system, is their ability to what's considered what's called an, a value added service. So unfortunately in our current environment, the way the healthcare authority has operated for most of our, our lives has been uh, that fee for service arrangement, right? Um, within that agreement that we have with our federal partners in our current environment, we're, we are limited uh, just to things that are authorized in our, our state plan, authorized by the feds. We can't really go above and beyond those things, which is basically treatment. Um, if you go to a managed care environment, those plans, using the money we've given them, have a lot more flexibility in what they can pay for. Or uh, like what we've seen in terms of value-added benefits for some of the plans is waiving cost, uh, cost sharing or not requiring a copay for certain visits. Uh, we also know uh, right now for uh, most of our population, there is a six prescription limit per month for our members. Um, I have seen some plans offer additional added services that say we're going to remove that pharmacy cap per month because we because they can do that within their within their um, within their flexibilities. You know, we've seen stories in other states and we've kind of heard from our plans too um, about folks that have been on the Medicaid programs in other states and they see spikes in ER usage during the summer. And it turns out that's just the place where some folks go to cool down. Their airs, their air conditioner units have gone out of their homes and they're not able to get refuge for that. So they will go to the ER. Um, a lot of times just to be in a cool environment, but also because some of their um, conditions have exacerbated from the heat. Uh, and we've seen plans do things like uh, give box fans and window units. Um, it's a lot cheaper for that plan to do things like that because they can rather than pay those constant ER visits. Uh, and they've, they've seen success in that. We really intend to enhance our level of care coordination and care management by leveraging these plans resources. Uh, just to give you an idea, so right now the healthcare authority has about 600 staff on staff. Um, we have a good amount of nurses internally that are able to do some good care management work with our populations, but we only have the resources to focus on those highest need. So think about like sickle cell anemia, folks that are um, high risk pregnancies, for example, we have a small set of resources to work directly with those members to make sure they're getting the care they need when they need it. By bringing on these three medical plans, we now are basically um, quadrupling the amount of staff that we have in order to do outreach, care management, care coordination. 
so that when members sign into Sooner Select and choose a plan, uh, they will go through a level of health risk screening. And so as you're going and engaging with the plans, I'll have a questionnaire for you um, tied to identify needs that may you may have that just have not been met in the past because of our resource limitations. Um, they, based on that health risk screening then, that you will be assigned a level of care coordination with a care coordinator. It may be that you don't have any risk. Um, well, there's the delivery man. Um, it may be that you don't have any needs that require ongoing care coordination. And so you may just get a, a letter or a text once a year or every six months. It may be that based on your, your, your screening that you have higher needs that have not been met and you're going to get a care coordinator who's going to reach out to you and do some more proactive calling and emailing and texting to work with you on that. Um, so, um, sorry, someone's at my house, uh, terrible timing. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's the basic fundamental. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea next on what to expect next. What's the timeline for this? Uh, so I did mention we have a dental plan and we have a medical plan. And I think I failed to mention, we also have what's called a children's specialty plan. The children's specialty plan is just for those kiddos who are in the custody of the state, either through, through child welfare or um, uh, child welfare or juvenile justice. So they, you know, if they're in the child welfare system, there's going to be one statewide plan that's going to meet the needs of those kiddos. We know that um, some kids may go throughout the state, depending on where their kinship placement may be or where their foster parent is, may not be whether the city where their, their home is. Uh, and it's important that, A, we have case managers that are specialized in meeting the needs of those kids, getting them the services they need, and can also follow them throughout the state. Um, and so what to expect next? I mentioned we have dental, and it's going ahead of the other plans. And it, it will actually... Um, it will actually go live uh, February 1st. Uh, so we will start sending letters out to members in late November that will then instruct members to say, your dental plan is going to go live um, February 1st. Here's the next steps to take. It's going to list the two plans that we have for that. It's going to tell you how to sign into your account, how to choose a benefit plan. We have, um, we have retrained our member services staff to be able to do what's called choice counseling, which is essentially to educate members on um, how to choose a plan, how to look at those value-added benefits. Now, our care coordinators and our, our member services folks cannot, cannot tell you which plan to choose, uh, but they can tell you the benefits and the value adds from each of those so that you can choose that. Um, and then our medical plan will go live April 1st. Uh, unfortunate date, I know it's April Fool's Day, but it's no joke. We are going live April 1st with medical. And so those letters will start going out in February. Um, again, with same information. Um, I, I sincerely apologize. I have a structural engineer here that is early to look at my house. Let me let him in really quickly. Terry, would you mind just taking some questions and, and filling the gap? I, I'm, I'm no, I don't sorry. mind at all. You're fine. And I've been trying to, trying to address some of the questions in the chat as of right now. Um, I know that uh, Sarah had asked if, um, sorry, my, it is not scrolling. Sarah asked, how do you know what plan to choose um, for the kids versus the adults? So the plans will be the same. It'll be the three plans that Trailer mentioned previously. And um, like he said, they will be sending out information on the plans. They cannot tell you which plan to choose, but they will tell you the benefits and the difference between each plan. And then will we send... Will we be sent an email with a link to the recording and be able to share with our coworkers? Yes, we can do that. And it will also be on the Oklahoma Family Network Facebook page. Um, I will put that in the chat. That or not Facebook, I'm sorry. It'll be on our Facebook as well, but it'll be on our website. And that usually takes about a week and a half to two weeks in order to get um the Zoom edited and uploaded onto the account. It takes a lot of man hours to do that. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then will providers still be able to look up eligibility and prior authorization status on OHCA's portal? And will they be required to have three separate 
logins for each of the three companies? That is a really good question. And we will get wait for Trailer to get back on that one, Jill, because I am not 100% sure on that. Um, and then what if the child has braces and it's paid by Medicaid? Will this Are affect the treatment? So if they're already in treatment, it will not change anything. I do know that. And then, yes, there's lots of information right now on the um, on the website about the changes to Sooner Select. Um, and then we will be releasing more information as it comes out. I know that, uh, like Trailer said, the dental. It's and it's going to be. It's important for families to know that there's two separate option periods that you'll have to choose your providers and or your plan and that will be for dental in December and then the letters for the medical will come out in February and that those choices will be opened in April or it'll go into effect in April I'm sorry um but yes I do know that if um if there is something currently already being taken care of, or if there's a, pro a treatment in process, that it will not affect that treatment. And just because, um, you know, we've heard this before and we've asked several questions. And then Trailer, can you answer, um, Jenny is asking, what were the three insurances again? And then we have another question about that after. You bet. And again, I'm so sorry about that. Um, yes, it, it is Aetna, uh, Better Health of Oklahoma, Healthy, uh, I'm sorry, Humana Healthy Horizons, and Oklahoma Complete Health, which is a subsidiary of Centene, which is also a national company. Uh, that's our three medical plans. Our dental plans are Liberty Dental and DentaQuest. Uh, I will say that I noticed there's a question about eligibility as well. Um, eligibility will still be conducted by the healthcare authority. So you would still go to mysoonercare.org. Uh, our staff, as well as human services staff, will still do that process. It's just that when you come into mysoonercare.org, after you've done your eligibility, that's when you are, you will choose your plan. Okay. So the other question is, will providers still be able to look up eligibility and prior authorization status on OHCA's portal, or will it be required to have three separate logins for each of the three companies? That's a great question. So one thing, um, you know, we attempted to go down this road in 2021 and then uh, had to pause briefly before coming back and uh, getting legislative authority and doing it again. Um, and one good thing we learned during that, what I'm calling a good dress rehearsal, was a lot of the, the administrative hassles and worries that uh, providers were letting us know about. One of those was just that, having to go into three different portals as a provider. So what we required in contract is that all of our uh, contracted entities have to agree to one single provider portal that they all use. Um, the portal is called Availity. It's widely known within the medical provider community. A lot of commercial insurance has already used it. Um, and these plans had just uh, thankfully already used that with their providers. And so uh, providers will still log into the Healthcare Authority website, the portal, to check eligibility. Um, the eligibility file for that member will then say uh, this member is a member of, let's say, Aetna. Uh, that's their plan for medical. And then from there, the provider will go into the availability screen, um, which again, a lot of providers, most of them take commercial insurance as well. So they already are accustomed to availability. They'll log into the availability, choose the plan, choose the member, and then do all of their prior authorization and billing and activities like that through the availability portal. So there will be an extra step um, because you still have to go from the healthcare authority portal to the availability portal, but it's uh, it's definitely not as, as, as worrisome as having three separate portals. Um, another thing we've done for providers is <laughs> we know that uh, right now providers just have to contract with the healthcare authority. You submit a contract, we do a level of screening, and then that provider can not provide sooner care services. Um, we wanted to make sure that providers did not have to do a contracting separately following very separate distinct processes for each of those plans. And so we've created a centralized verification organization. So providers will still come in and get screened through the healthcare authority, and then they'll go through this centralized verification organization um, for the other credentialing steps. And then that organization will give that decision to the three plans. Um, that way, they're not having to go with separate routes of contracting or uh, credentialing, that is, with, with all the plans. 
Um, so we're hopeful too. We've heard really good feedback from our provider community about the steps we've taken to kind of reduce that abrasion with them um, and making it more administratively burdensome for them. Uh, Joni also had a great point uh, out there. I did early on in the chat, I put uh, the link to our public website and the Sooner Select program and overall information. Uh, our comms team is doing a really good job of putting out good timelines about when you can expect those next steps. Um, we are in the process of finalizing a benefit comparison guide. So what it will look like essentially is columns for each of the plans that we have, the base benefits, and then those value added benefits that you can decide which one of those plans is a better fit for you and your family based on those value added benefits. Um, so before I had to take a pause a while ago, I was mentioning that um, there'll be letters going out telling you when to enroll uh, and, and how to do that. And um, you can do that through mysoonercare.org uh, after having looked at those value added benefits. Um, and then you can even call our member services hotline who will then walk you through that much as they can walk you through your eligibility application. Um, and if let's, let's say you, the, you don't get the letter for whatever reason, we are going to do outbound emails and text alerts as well. But let's say you, uh, you, you miss that and you don't make an active choice. Um, we know based on other state experiences nationally that on average, less than 20% of, of Medicaid members in the nation actively choose a plan during that initial open enrollment. Um, so we will give up to um, about 30, let's say 15 days prior to go live. Uh, we will do whoever has not made an active choice. We'll do a uh, series of auto assignments. And so if you've not made an active choice, we will assign you to a plan. Now, it's not just a basic assignment, though. There's going to be several factors that we're going to look at when doing that, one of which is we want to ensure that families are kept together. Uh, we know it's not going to do anything for care coordination or ease of care if we assign mom and dad and all the kiddos to different plans. We want you to all be on the same plan. So we'll assign based on the family and the system that we have. Um, and then we're going to look to see who is your primary care provider? Where, uh, who have you seen to receive your primary care within the last six months? Or who's your PCP on file? And we want to make sure that PCP is in the network of the plan we assign you to. Um, so let's say we go to assign you to Humana and our system says, oh, nope, looks like they saw Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith is not in Humana's network. Then we'll go down to the next plan in the row, which may be Edna. And it looks like, oh, yep, Dr. Smith is in Edna's plan. Let's go ahead and auto assign. Let's say then we auto assign and you get that call from Edna. And um, at that point, the family is like, I don't want Edna. I uh, I wanted I, I saw the, the mail. I just forgot to respond. And I have wanted to go with Oklahoma Complete Health this whole time. You have 60 days to then decide to choose. Uh, now, once you make that second choice, whether you have come in and you chose one and then changed your mind a couple of weeks later and chose the second, after that second choice, you're locked into a plan for that plan enrollment year. Um, and so, and then we'll have open enrollment kind of annually about this time of year, every year. Um, so you'll be locked in unless there's good cause. Um, and the good cause list is fairly short, uh, but I will say we've gotten questions about what if me or my family needs specialty care and that specialist is not in the network of the plan that I chose. And I didn't realize that till six months in. Um, the goal there is we want you to then have that conversation with your plan representatives, talk to your member services agent with that plan, let them know that you want to see the specialist. They have a lot of options available to them. Uh, their goal will be to get that specialist in network and do what they need to do that. Now, I will say plans have a lot more flexibility than we do in how they reimburse. So it may be a enhanced fee schedule for that specialist to come into network. If, let's say, the provider doesn't want to be in network, but they will... Uh, agree to see a family on a single basis, then they can do a single case agreement with that provider to say, we want you to serve the needs of this family, even if it's just this one time. Um, so they have a lot of, um, uh, they have a lot more flexibility than we do in doing that and those kinds of arrangements. So that's the initial goal. Let's say you just can't come to a resolution with the plan. Um, then there's an, it's called a grievance and appeal process to where it, it escalates. And then they have folks kind of research what the grievance is. And if at the end of that process, there's not a resolution and it results in you still wanting to leave the plan, that request will come over to the healthcare authority. And then my staff will be the ones to say that you're right. Uh, this family does not need to be in this plan anymore. We will disenroll them and then re-enroll them into a plan of their choice. 
Um, the only, uh, the healthcare authority is the only entity that can do that. The plan cannot disenroll you on their own uh, arbitrarily. They cannot automatically uh, shift you over to a different plan. Only the healthcare authority can do that. Um, and speaking of kind of healthcare authority uh, oversight and monitoring, the healthcare authority is not going anywhere. Uh, we're not just handing the entire program over to these contracted entities and just focusing on the ABD population. Uh, we are shifting the way we operate in a large way uh, to be more of a monitoring oversight compliance entity with these large contractors. So we expect to get on average thousands of reports a month from our contracted entities that we are building out a team of about 20 to 25 people internally that will receive these reports. Um, these reports are uh, basically get at everything that's required in the contract. We want to know what their provider network looks like. We want to know if we see a spike in prior authorization denials, for example, or we see a dip in services or a dip in provider network. We're going to know that in real time. And that allows us to react and act on those that information with our plans to say, why is there a dip in mental health services? Uh, what are you doing there? Did you increase your prior authorization requirements? Did you lose providers in your network? We need to make sure that's addressed quickly. Um, and so that's kind of going to give you a flavor of what my team is going to be doing moving forward and the healthcare authority in general is even though we're not a directly administering the program one-on-one, -on -one, we are overseeing those that do and we want to make sure that their standards are maintained as high as possible. Um, which in a lot of ways are even higher standards than we've been able to operate under. So just giving you an idea about prior authorization turnouts, for example, sometimes it may take us a week. We, we, we have strived to be the best, but to get like therapy, um, PAs approved, we're requiring those to be done within like 36 hours for plans. And so there's a really high standards that we're going to stay on top of and monitoring. So I wanted to ask a question, and I think I know the answer, but before I answer this, I want to give it to you, Trailer. And um, Jill asked, will prior authorization requirements be the same for each of the three, or will there be a chance the requirements could differ from plan to plan? And I, my response was that you had previously said that they were locked into the current policy for two years. Is that correct? So the, the two-year moratorium applies to rates, so reimbursement rates. Oh, for right. Rates. I'm sorry. Um, but on an ongoing basis, we uh, they cannot, in general, be more restrictive in their criteria than the healthcare authority is, unless we have said they can. Um, but I will say what we're seeing is, in our conversations with these plans, um, I guess the answer to the direct question is, yes, they can vary. They can't be more restrictive than the healthcare authority. Now, what we have seen is some of the plans have said, Healthcare authority, why are you prior authorizing prior authorizing this service? This is a service that maybe doesn't make sense to be prior authorized. Prior authorized, so we may see some level of service PAs being lifted and making it easier to go through the system, uh, even compared to how we do that today. And there may be some times whenever the plans, uh, as we talk to them, are saying we've identified a service that maybe you're not prior authorizing and you should, and then their CMOs, their chief medical staff will have conversations with our staff, and we may jointly agree to make a prior authorization more restrictive based on the evidence. Uh, but we don't expect that to be a common occurrence, and we would, and at that point, we would expect that to be kind of across the board with all the plans. Okay, great. And then um, I just want to address Leslie's question real quick. I know Joni had asked her on or answered her on that the IDD adults um, and the home support waivers would not be changing away from the healthcare authority. But then her second question was, if it's not, then what is the reasoning for them remaining under the OHCA umbrella? Yes, the uh, that is correct. The waivers uh, in the age-blind disabled population are remaining with the healthcare authority and the Department of Human Services to manage the oversight of those programs. Um, so uh, you alluded to this initially, and, and not being an OHA choice necessarily, although we are very much on board, uh, it was a legislative requirement done last, last year or the year before last that required the healthcare authority to go towards managed care. Um, within that legislation, um, it was it mandated the populations that would go to Sooner Select and those that would not. Um, so the populations were actually outlined in legislation. Uh, I will say, based on other state experiences nationally, as they rolled out new managed care platforms, um, the the population that's remaining in the current environment, as you know, is a lot more complex to manage. And uh, there's a lot more room for error um, and maybe uh, disruption to services or disruption to families during that transition. Um, we've seen this in several states and you probably are familiar with the headlines of the last 10 years where it go well. 
Um, so I think this is really a way of moving a population over uh, understanding the mechanics of, of managed care as a new state to this, uh, getting some successes in our implementation with this population, and then um, allowing our legislators to evaluate that and evaluate our performance and monitoring the program and then rethinking adding in new populations as we go forward. Great, thank you very much. I don't see any more questions on there, so. Um, trailer. Actually, Cindy Gould has a question that sure. isn't related to Sooner Select, but I think mm -hmm. it only take you a second to answer if you don't mind. You bet. Cindy, do you want to come off mute? Yes, um, my son is an adult on the waiver. He's 19 years old, and I recently received an explanation of medical benefits from OHCA, and okay. it it indicated um, the benefits that it said paid last month, but there were dates of July, um, August, and actually a couple June, but um, some of them I don't really understand. Um, it's not clear to me, you know, it wasn't like a medical provider. So how do I get more information about what those payments were related to? It does give the address, um, the OHCA address, but I didn't know if there was someone who I could actually speak with or... Absolutely. Yeah, call our member services. Um, now, I will say you may experience a little longer than usual wait time because okay. we're going through the public health emergency unwinding and uh, folks will have questions about Sooner Select. But sure, call call member services, um, okay. give them the um, the Sooner Care ID for your kiddo, and then they will look it up. Um, yeah, it could be. So like we've seen families, for example, I'm not saying this is the case, but we've seen families get EOBs and say, I don't remember, we didn't receive this service. What is this? Um, and they call in and it allows us the opportunity to dig in deeper with that provider to see what services was provided, if it was provided. Uh, but yeah, yeah, sure. Call member services and they can talk to you through that. Okay. And I can find that just from uh, your website then? The yes. Phone yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you there so you much. Go. Yeah. Joni just put the helpline out there for you. Yay! Thank you, Joni. Um, I saw Sorry some questions in title. general. I saw some questions in general about um, prior authorizations and services. I wanted to know too that after we go live, there's a 90 day continuity of care period, which just basically means for 90 days, if you had an open PA for a service with the healthcare authority, the plans will honor that prior authorization and service request for the first 90 days of go live. So we don't want families worried that, oh gosh, that means April 1st, all of my current authorized services are just going to. That 90 day period is really there to make sure that we have services continue while we also allow our plan partners to maybe um, do a reassessment or ask for a new evaluation. Uh, again, maybe doing a prior authorization, but it also cannot be more strict than we would do today. Uh, I see Taylor, a question about, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you might mention the days and times that are the highest call volume. I believe they said Mondays, Fridays, lunchtime at the beginning of the day, the end of the day. And then I think Tuesday was a pretty busy day too. So they said Wednesday, yeah. Thursday, not at the beginning or end of the day or lunchtime. You probably can get through more quickly. Yeah, that's accurate. I, we were joking the other day. It's like, so literally when it's the most convenient for you to call, that's when you're going to see higher call times. <laughs> I, I will say that we're working with our call center folks. Um, we are already upping our staffing levels, knowing that we're going to get an influx of calls. We go to Sooner Select. Oh, we've already started training around choice counseling. Um, I'm talking to our director of that division to see about extended call hours. Uh, so that maybe, like you said, you know, it's most convenient to be able to call in the evening when you've gone off of work or maybe a little earlier in the morning. And so we're looking at how we can kind of rearrange uh, staffing levels, do some extended hours to make it a little more convenient for you. Okay, so we had another, a couple of questions in the chat. And um, the first one is who will be doing, or who will be the credentialing agency for the providers? So uh, when I, I think this is in reference to my comment about a centralized verification organization, um, the plans are going to use CAQH, is the credentialing organization. Um, now I will say, 
that it's going to take some time for the our three plans to get coordinated with CEQH and implement that process. But we have worked out a plan to where in the first year for that first 15 month period um, that the plans will just utilize OACA's provider screening through our currently contracted network and accept that as credentialed for year one. So the credentialing process year one um, should be a little easier, uh, less administratively burdensome uh, than maybe in, in the next years. But uh, we'll start rolling out a credentialing cadence and a timeline over the next 15 months so that providers can kind of get in a regular routine of uh, credentialing. But CAQH to answer the question will be that vendor. Great, thank you. And so the other question was, this may be a little bit um, too into the weeds, but will speech therapy patients still be required to have yearly face-to-face -face appointments with their referring providers for their therapy authorizations? Uh, it, it's a great question, not too in the weeds. I just don't happen to know the answer. So I will say that it's dependent on each of the plans and how they want to manage that. It could be that it's less. It could be that they match our criteria. Um, but we'll start f uh, fleshing out more of those requirements as we build out our benefit comparison guide. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any other questions before we go over anything new or move on? Okay. Now my door shutting and opening. <laughs> Sorry. So if I if I could, um, and I'll allow more, of course, more sooner select questions as they come in. But I wanted to just briefly touch on the public health emergency and what we are calling the unwinding process, which essentially is the unenrollment of all the Medicare Medicaid members who have been on the are on on the rolls over the last three years uh, because of the public health emergency. But beginning April 1st, we began unenrolling members who no longer meet eligibility criteria based on the information we have to us. So that was about 300,000 members uh, over a nine month period, April through the end of December. Um, the first three months were folks that mostly were, were well over income ha or had never utilized the program, uh, had commercial insurance as a third party payer, we looked at things such as, uh, are there children under the age of five in the home? And if, if there weren't, then they were kind of slated for an earlier unenrollment. Um, so right now we are a little over halfway done. I think we're getting close to the 200,000 mark of unenrolled members. Um, but really the, me the message I wanna convey there is, um, please check your mystudentcare.org account. Uh, and as much as you can communicate that, we want folks to know, just check your mystudentcare.org account. Go in there, update your information. It could be that you are still eligible. It may just be that the information we have on file for you doesn't, that you have attested in the past on income doesn't match the information we're getting from data sources. And so we need that resolution of that data set. Um, so we need folks to go in, update their accounts, make sure they've done a full renewal um, so that you can keep your coverage. Um, we're also working with a company called Unite Us so that at the end of every month, after we've unenrolled about 30,000 on average members, we give that unenrollment file to Unite Us, who will then do a level of outreach and care coordination. Uh, the purpose of which is, even though you don't have coverage through Sooner Care or private insurance, we wanna make sure you're still coordinated to a, and referred to some place that you can still get free or reduced cost services, such as a free and charitable clinic or a federally qualified health center. Um, and so we will continue to do this unenrollment process through the end of December, and then we'll start kind of getting back to what the new normal is um, uh, for, for Medicaid and everything else. But happy to answer any questions about that, too. I do see a question about will the income or requirements change once we go to Sooner Select? No, that's a great question. So I did mention earlier the Healthcare Authority will still continue to be the, uh, we will determine the eligibility criteria. We will adjudicate eligibility ability decisions, you'll still go to mysoonercare.org, and those those will not be changing. Um, the only thing that changes is kind of who's paying the provider of the service, who's doing the prior authorization, and kind of care coordination piece of it. The great question. Thank you so much, Trailer. Um, Amelia, did we have any um, questions on the Spanish speaking from the Spanish speaking families? No? Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, I was just trying to field through the chat real quick. 
because some come through privately and same, some came through the general chat. And I just want to say if um, everybody that is on here, you do have the option to click the three dots next to the emoji icon on the bottom right hand side of the um, chat screen. And you can save the chat with all the information, including the uh, links that have been entered and the questions and the answers that are in there as well. Um, and, and I just, Terry, I dropped a email address in the chat. It's Sooner Select at OKHCA.org. That's our general Sooner Select mailbox. Um, if you have a question like this, I will say too, if you visit our Sooner Select page, there is a, an ongoing living question and answer document. So as we get questions and answer them, we add it to that. So check that first and maybe that we've already answered the question. But if you have gone through that and say, I know I have a, still, I have a, I have a new question, submit it to that inbox. Uh, we'll get an answer to you from that team and then add it to the Q&A document. Then. That's great. Is there a quick at a glance income family guide we can look at? Yes. If you go to our public website, there is uh, under probably my sooner, or if you go to mysoonercare.org, there is a income guide. And I believe it's broke down by plans. Um, and that's the Medicaid expansion. The yes. um, Yeah. And then the general center care and as well as insure Oklahoma and. And then I'll break it down by household yeah. size. And yes. Income. And that link is in the chat. Oh, okay. Thank you, Joni. Does anybody have any other questions while we're on here? Well, I want to say thank you again for having me and my apologies for the brief disruption, but um, thank you. Uh, it, it, the folks on the call, Joni and Terry know how to get a hold of me. If you have any questions and want to communicate through them, happy to do that. Again, sooner select uh, email address there if you have any further follow-up questions, I'm always happy to come back uh, as we start going this, through this transition. I will say that in my almost 20 year career of doing large scale projects like this, they have never been done perfectly with, with no hiccups. And so I'm already creating that expectation. We know there's gonna be some bumps in the road, um, but we want providers and members and everyone to feel comfortable let, for you to let us know what those are so that we can quickly respond and fix them moving forward. So. Any of the contact information you've received today, if you get a weird letter in the mail that doesn't feel right, or you are hearing something from a plan that doesn't sound right, let us know that. Um, I will say too, just so you know, the plans cannot, they're actually federally prohibited by law from doing um, proactive engagement with you if you have not chosen them to be your plan. So if you start hearing from any of the plans that I mentioned uh, about Medicaid in particular, uh, before you have chosen them, let us know that because that's a strict no, no. Um, and so you should only start hearing from plan representatives once you've made the choice for them to be your plan. Um, and then they're working with you moving forward. But yeah, happy to please keep us in the loop and things you're hearing in the community. Thank well, you. And so I might just, and I might say one other thing, Terry, is once that comparison chart on all the different plans are available, I think we could pretty easily, don't you, Terry, email out both the link to this recording as well as that comparison chart so you guys no, will have easy access to it. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get an Oklahoma Family Network. We, we actually contract with the healthcare authority to help share family voice with them you know we 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 have an advisory where we where the healthcare authority actually listens to its members and so we have a great relationship with a lot of the staff at the healthcare authority and i will say that um usually we share on our facebook page on our website any upcoming changes that they have and i just want to give props to trailer because I will say I don't know during these confusing times how many other states have their Medicaid director come on and do a Zoom with the families directly to answer questions um, and to see, you know, just to alleviate, alleviate any concerns that they may have. We've been getting a lot of questions um, from families that we serve and that you, we help. And so we want to help get as much information out to the families that need it as possible. So I will also drop my email in the chat if anybody has any questions or anything, or um, if they just, you know, ask, can we have this video? Can we, you know, if you don't get it in the email in a timely manner, or if you think we forget about you, just go ahead and send it to that email in the chat too. 
So before we get off, does anybody have any other questions? All right. Well, we really appreciate your time. Trailer, we're going to give you a couple of minutes um, back to your lunch so you can maybe eat something. Um, <laughs> and we are so grateful that you joined us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you, Trailer. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You guys have a great Friday.